In an earlier video, we looked at an active users model meant to model the number of users currently using an online platform. This is the sort of behaviour we saw. The number of users keeps on fluctuating randomly. Of course, it's a random process, but it settles down to a stable distribution, shown here on the right. In this video, we're going to see how to calculate this stable distribution. In this active users model, it could tell us, for example, the 99th percentile of load that our online platform will experience. Or, if we had a Markov model for an endemic disease, we could learn, for example, the average prevalence and also the likely load on the health service when the disease flares up. OK, so let's get started. We'll start with the definition. Stationary distribution. I'll give you a moment to read. Let me expand some of the notation here. The condition x0 twiddles pi, i.e. x0 has distribution pi, that just means that the probability that x0 takes value little x is equal to pi sub x. In other words, this condition says, suppose the initial state is chosen randomly, and that we pick state x with probability pi sub x. The definition says that if we pick the initial state randomly like this, then the state in the next time step will also have distribution pi. And then we can reset the clock. It doesn't matter when we start the Markov chain, doesn't matter whether we start counting from time 1 or from time 0, so we can just apply the definition again and say because x1 had distribution pi, therefore x2 will have distribution pi. And so on. By induction, the distribution is the same at every time step. That's why it's called the stationary distribution, because the distribution doesn't move. Remember, the Markov chain itself is moving. It jumps around from state to state. It's not xn that is stationary. It's the probability distribution of xn that is stationary. OK, that's the definition of stationarity. Let's see if we can calculate it. Here's a simple Markov chain state space diagram for my Cambridge weather simulator. Let's see if we can derive the stationary distribution using nothing more than that definition of stationarity we just saw. The definition says that if we start at time 0 in distribution pi, then x1 will also have distribution pi. But there is another way to get at the distribution of x1 using all of the standard types of Markov chain calculation tricks that we saw in the last video. Here, we're using the law of total probability to condition on x0, because that lets us introduce the one-step transition probability. This is good. The first term is nothing other than the transition matrix, and the second term is pi, the distribution that we assumed for x0. So what we've derived is a formula for pi x in terms of the whole pi vector. Let's just write out these equations, one equation for every state x. We could write them all like this with algebra, or if we wanted to, we could write it as a matrix equation. Anyway, we have three equations and we have three unknowns. But there is a problem. There's redundancy in these equations. You can see that straight away, in fact. If I have a solution for pi rain, pi drizzle and pi grey, and I multiply all my three values by 100, I'll still end up with a solution to these equations. In other words, there's nothing in these equations that says pi has to be a probability vector. So let's just stick that in as an extra equation. When we do this, we have a set of simultaneous equations that we can solve. Of course, you don't want to be solving equations like this with pen and paper when you have a computer in front of you. Let's rewrite the equations in linear algebra form so we can use standard library packages for linear algebra. Here is the matrix notation for the equations that we've just written down. Also, I've written pi dot 1 equals 1. In other words, our extra equation that says pi has to sum to 1. And here's code for solving it. I'm just writing out exactly those matrix equations in NumPy syntax. 
Just one little comment here. I was lazy in my code. I just stuck on the extra condition pi dot one equals one as an extra row of my matrix equation. So I'm giving NumPy a linear system with four equations and only three unknowns. So one of the equations is redundant. The lazy thing to do is to call NumPy's least squares function. If we give it equations that can be solved, as we've done here, it will solve them regardless of the redundancy. If we gave it equations that have multiple solutions, it will return one of them. If we gave it equations that have no solution because they contradict each other, it will just give us a least squares compromise. So this code always runs happily, and if the math tells us there's a unique solution, then we don't need to worry at all because NumPy will find it. What we just did here works for any Markov chain at all. Let's state the general result. Pause and have a read. Now I'm going to be very pedantic here. The result says if pi is a stationary distribution, then it solves these equations. It doesn't say that these equations can be solved, nor does it say that if they can be solved, then there's a unique solution. What we need is an existence and uniqueness theorem. Pause the video and have a read. This theorem looks very technical. It assumes two things. First, that the state space is finite. Second, something called irreducibility. These conditions actually have really very clear intuition behind them. Here's our epidemic model again. In the epidemic model, the state space was infinite. It was the entire set of natural numbers. When you have an infinite state space, a Markov chain can potentially explode, i.e. head off and never return, as these trajectories look like they're set to do. And if the process explodes, a stationary distribution might not even exist. And what about the other condition about irreducibility? Irreducibility means there is a path from any state to any other. This epidemic model isn't irreducible because once we reach the state where zero people are infected, the infection is dead, and so the Markov chain stays in state zero. You can see it here. The Markov chain might reach state zero and get stuck there. It's called an absorbing state, by the way. So these are two possible pathologies. In cases like this, the theorem just doesn't apply. There might be no stationary distribution, or there might be multiple stationary distributions. I should also say that this theorem just goes one way. It says if these conditions are met, then the chain has a stationary distribution. It's not an if and only if. Here is an illustration, our active users model. We set this up to have an infinite state space but it didn't explode, it just settled down, and it does have a stationary distribution. OK, so that's all about stationary distributions. I just want to give one more example to show you a shortcut for solving the equations. Here are the stationarity equations again. There's a matrix equation here, and it can be a real piece of work to solve. There's a shortcut that sometimes works called detailed balance. Pause the video and have a read. This may seem like a silly little curiosity, barely worth mentioning, except for one thing. There's a powerful tool for computational Bayesian analysis, much more precise than the crude tool we've used in this course, which hinges on detailed balance. It's called Gibbs sampling, and you'll learn about it next year. For now, all I want to do is work through a very simple toy example using detailed balance. By the way, this statement here that if pi solves detailed balance, then it solves the stationarity equations, that's totally trivial to prove. You just write out the stationary equations, substitute in the detailed balance, and it all drops out with no effort at all. OK, here's an example. We're asked to find the stationary distribution for this Markov chain. It never hurts to try to solve detail balance for any Markov chain at all. Either we solve it and it gives us a stationary distribution without much work, or we quickly find that it can't be solved and we have to go back to the full stationarity equations. So let's try solving it. 
we want to find a vector pi satisfying this equation for every pair of states x and y. We just write out a bunch of equations, one for every possible pair of states x and y. Some of these equations are redundant, but we can just solve the equations that are left and then stick in the constraint that we're looking for a distribution, i.e. that pi a plus pi b plus pi c have to sum to 1, and we get a solution. So this was an easy way to find the stationary distribution. OK, so that's everything about stationary distributions. But before I finish, I have to confess to a white lie. Remember this plot from the active users model where we said that the Markov chain settled down into a stationary distribution? That's not actually what this plot shows. To create this histogram, I counted up the long run fraction of time spent in each state. Now, we've been working out stationary distributions, but we haven't said anything at all about what stationarity has to do with long run fractions. Stationarity says if you start in distribution pi, then you remain in distribution pi. But I didn't start these chains in distribution pi. And what's more, the conclusion xn has distribution pi is just not the same thing as saying the long run fraction of time spent in state little x is equal to pi sub x. We need another theorem. This is called the ergodic theorem. It says that the long run fraction of time spent in state little x is equal to pi sub x, where pi is the stationary distribution. Ergodic is just a fancy word for time averaged. What's more important than this theorem, actually, is understanding that there are different sorts of averages we can take. In climate science, for example, modelers run multiple simulations and each simulation covers multiple days. You could ask a time average question like, for run number 15, what percentage of days were hotter than 38 degrees C? Or you could ask what's called an ensemble question. Across all my runs, what percentage of days were hotter than 38 degrees C? Markov chains are a great starting point for thinking about this sort of issue because they're simple to simulate and simple enough to analyze and because they can have all sorts of interesting behaviors. For example, they can have ensemble averages and time averages that disagree.